good to be here with you all. I'm going to say right up front that um, it is raining pretty hard here, and we have Bible study happening in one room and a Dharma conversation happening in another and Shelly teaching in a third room. So I'm not sure how the <laughs> internet's going to hold up for any of us and what the weather's going to do to contribute. Um, but I'm wondering how the, just give me a thumbs up if I sound fine and non-robotic. All right. And um, there is both a Wi-Fi connection and an extender connection that I can use. So if I start to sound funny or if I drop off and come back, then perhaps you can just be brave and let me know somehow, either by gesturing to me that you can't hear or give me a thumbs down or just unmute yourself and tell me as best you can or type it in the chat so that I know what's going on. So cool, we can work together on that tonight. Awesome, thank you. All right. <laughs> that works too, Jillian, if you just want to do that. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Okay, so let's get still together. I'm going to meditate. We can take a couple of deep breaths together. And imagine that even though we're not sharing space, the simple inhaling and exhaling of communal air reminds us that we belong to each other. like it or not. And as the breath finds its own way, unencumbered by our wishes for the breath, we can appreciate this expression of life Breathing, however it is for each of us, reminds us that we have some life energy to use. We have some benefit to offer ourselves and each other. And allowing the heart to abide in this simple appreciation. Grateful that we're alive and we have this life to practice, to cultivate goodness.
And with this kind of grounding of basic goodness, basic appreciation, simple appreciation, we can understand that there's no need to try to change the breath or the body or the heart or the mind. The experience we know of mind or body is simply a, an expression of life, an expression of karma. An expression of nature. Not something that needs to be fixed or resolved. A distracted mind doesn't need to be resolved. Sleepiness doesn't need to be resolved. Restlessness doesn't need to be resolved. It simply needs to be met. Met as an expression of life. Met as an expression of truth. Perhaps we're practicing with an anchor such as the breath or sound, an anchor being something that we return to, something we are, something that's supporting us to connect and land in the present moment again and again. Or perhaps we're practicing a more receptive style of awareness, not directing the attention anywhere, but just cultivating a relaxed attitude, a relaxed and spacious, inclusive attitude that welcomes the breath or sound or body sensation in any moment, strengthening the habit of awareness to Say yes, again and again. And both of these are important and useful ways to practice. One is not better than the other. 
just different ways of strengthening this habit of being here. And so no matter how we're practicing, what we're doing is cultivating this habit of yes. Yes, this is the way it is for me for now. Honoring the familiar noticings, body sensations, expressions of body, expressions of heart, emotions and thoughts, or whatever's here in the familiar realm. Honoring also the depth of our intuitive awareness, felt sense, something that the conceptual mind can't name. There's no need to figure that out. You can just nod to it, yep. Yes to this. Yes to this expression of nature. No need to doubt what's being known.
And we'll continue in silence together, cultivating a habit of yes, and trusting our practice.
and opening your eyes when you're ready. Thanks for your practice, everyone. And take a moment to stretch or tend to the body. If you'd like to also take a minute to look around and wave, say hello to everybody here. You're welcome to turn on your camera. Of course, no requirement for that. You can also notice the names, appreciate the presence. Hey. Curious if anyone's here for the first time, either new to Common Ground or new to these Wednesday night practice groups. If you are, if you'd like to, you can unmute yourself and say hello. And so this ninth chapter, you don't, you know, you're not missing out on, well, I can't say that for sure, but <laughs> you don't have to have, you, you don't, what's the right way to say that? It's okay if you haven't read any of the previous chapters. It's okay if you haven't read any of the chapters. Just showing up here is on any... Wednesday night is great, and you should hopefully be able to get something out of each of the offerings. Um, this ninth chapter is called Nibbana the Beautiful. And this is one of my favorite little books these days. <laughs> called The First Free Women. It's uh, poems of the early Buddhist nuns, so poems uh, that were originally in the Terigata, which is a collection of poems written by awakened women at the time of the Buddha. We have so little of the stories of nuns. You can see how thin this little book is, this latest book that was edited or written by Maddie Weingast. I just can't get enough of these poems these days. Um, a couple weeks back, Patrice Kelsch and I, who is usually here on Wednesdays but is not, is having some time with her granddaughter tonight. Um, we led a, a poetry night, and we read some of the poems that we really like and told some stories of the nuns at the... Their, their histories. So each poem is, is titled by the person who wrote it. And so this one is Badra. You always considered yourself lucky because things, things seemed to work out the way you wanted. Now luck has a different meaning. Lucky to be walking a path that finds peace in the arising and passing away of each present moment, regardless of how things work out or don't. Read that one more time. You always considered yourself lucky because things seemed to work out the way you wanted. Now luck has a different meaning. Lucky to be walking a path that finds peace in the arising and passing away of each present moment regardless of so it's a different orientation to life, right? It's probably true for you as it is for me that we are creatures, these human beings that we are, creatures that are always seeking some kind of positive experience or pleasant experience, some win or success, 
and using that to gauge our goodness. We're on the right track or we're a good human or somehow succeeding at life if we have these markers that we can rely on. And as we walk this path, as we take up this practice of following this path, allowing this path to guide our lives and it slowly starts to change us. It slowly has changed me. It's not so much about looking for the next goodie, but more about appreciating the depth of experience that, that's here. And at these times that we're living in, life is complicated, isn't it? I mean, really complicated for us. And for those who celebrate any of the winter holidays, it feels complicated. What do we do? How do we make decisions that honor our, our relational experience with others and that honor our collective well-being, taking care of each other in a pandemic? I was just speaking with a friend about how nuanced our decision making is and how it can feel difficult to be in relationship with people who don't share the same opinions about how things should go, which is all of the time. <laughs> We're in relationship with people who don't show share every opinion, but it seems to be punctuated as we, you know, approach holidays and such. And so I wanted to offer something tonight that both honors the complexity and points us in a direction that is really trustworthy. I think last week Patrice, who was teaching here, um, talked about the heavenly messengers. Is that right for anybody that was here? Yeah? All right, yeah. So I wanted to, you know, I was inspired a couple weeks ago reading, rereading that I've read this collection of poetry so many times and um, rereading it a couple of weeks ago, I was inspired to, to read a little bit more and study a little bit more about these women at the time of the Buddha. And I picked up a book written by a, a teacher who I've taught with a little bit, um, Pam Weiss, who is a wonderful, wonderful teacher, and she wrote a new book this year called A Bigger Sky, Awakening a Fierce Feminine Buddhism. It's really quite nice. I appreciated it. And so as we unpack together tonight some of the history that is often removed some of the stories, some of the relational experiences of the Buddha and before the Buddha became the Buddha, of this man, Siddhartha, who left home and followed this path to freedom and then taught about it. I'd like to unpack some of the experiences in his life from uh, perhaps different vantage points than we typically explore. So last week, Patrice probably, her talk's not up on the web yet, so I haven't listened to it, but she probably um, at least mentioned this story of when the Buddha left home and encountered, um, you know, he was living in royalty. He was a prince and living a very privileged life and then left and got a taste of reality, which included old age, sickness, and death. And it was really shocking. Yeah. And what we often don't talk about is that, you know, the Buddha's experience and ours too, you know, how it relates to ours is, goes way back to childhood. And the Buddha was this, was born, um, his mother died about a week 
after he was born. And he was raised by his aunt, his mom's sister. So his mother, Maya, um, gave birth to Siddhartha. Her sister actually was there and delivered the child. And then she died within seven days. And there's so little recorded about these women, right? The Buddha's mother, the Buddha's aunt, Pajapati, who ordained with the Buddha after the Buddha's awakening and went on to be a fully awakened being. And also the Buddha's wife, Yasodhara, who uh, he left, when he left home, he left his wife to care for their young son, Rahula. So I was just, as I was reading, just sort of like, oh God, this is so relational. This is so relatable. Our lives are so messy, aren't they? They're not like straightforward. And we can somehow read these teachings and the suttas and think that our practice follows a particular linear path. Like we understand this and we understand that. Then we go here, then we go there and beat ourselves up along the way if it doesn't shake out like that. But as I was reading some of this history and kind of translating it into my own life experiences, just appreciating how relationally challenging our lives are. And this all becomes the uh, what we work with in practice. So, you know, it's really wonderful to have these experiences and practice that help us deepen our faith in the path. And it's wonderful to develop some useful tools like the tool of touching peace, of feeling into the, um, the way that the mind knows how to connect and sustain itself like in, a, in the present moment and how good that feels like, oh, this mind can develop that habit of samadhi, that habit of being here. And yet it's so much more than that. It's so much more than that. And often what we start to unpack in practice is our deep wounding. That seems to go way back. And often in daily life, what we're touching more than anything is the five hindrances. We're really working in this territory. So it's great that we have these wonderful experiences and it's really true also that we have some ability to uh, connect with the challenges that our hearts encounter. So those moments of doubt and those moments of restlessness and those moments of fear and clinging and I don't wanna that attitude, you know, too tired or apathetic or depressed. Now these are all expressions of what we might call the hindrances. Those experiences that somehow obscure the radiant, clear, compassionate heart. And so we want to learn how to appreciate these moments, really appreciate that what's being unearthed in practice is often our you know, willingness to get close to these, to our deepest wounding. And in fact, this might go on for years or decades. One of my teachers said that for the first 15 years of their practice, they were just doing psychological work. This is a person who practiced as a monk in Burma for quite a long time and was still like, you know, doing psychological work even at that point. And that's what we're all doing a lot of the time, understanding and reckoning with patterns, like our own patterns of mind that tend towards this or that kind of hindrance. Some of us might lean in the direction of grasping after pleasant experience and others might, like me, 
be yoked towards more towards aversive states of mind and this is all just really normal territory so we want to appreciate that in even in this unearthing process that we're in that it's actually good practice it's really good practice it's really really good practice and we don't have to have this view that you know we can set down this view that practice is somehow this attainment of pleasant mind states but we can develop an appreciation a habit of appreciation a habit of yes to all of these difficult places that we touch to the ways that our lives are messy and relationally challenged i was moving about my day and i was just kind of paying attention to the mind and there was some aversion there kind of a low level of aversion while i was just doing my day and i was kind of um, impressed at the strength of it <laughs> i was like a little bit wild by wow this is just hanging on huh you're just gonna hang on here sweetie aren't you <laughs> just a little low-grade aversion that seemed to not want to release no matter what and there was a there wasn't too much um trying to get rid of it but just a willingness to allow it to be in the background to appreciate that it has a nature and a and an arising and a passing away and it will come and go on its own terms and we can learn this in the messiness of our lives so i'd like to uh, read a little bit from this book a bigger sky and discuss um, how we might consider what's been left out sometimes of the teachings or how we might have a fuller understanding of the Buddha's life and complicatedness and feel like, you know, hopefully that will help us feel like we're on the right track in our own complicated, messy lives and appreciate that we're still on the path of awakening, even with all of the complicatedness and the messiness of life. So Pam Weiss, the author of this book, did as much study as she could and then told stories of, you know, based on her research and understanding, there's really so little about these um, women in the suttas, in the teachings. So the Buddha's mom, Maya, his aunt, Pajapati, and his wife, Yasodhara. And I'll focus more on on Maya and Pajapati than on Yasodhara, at least for tonight. Um, so what she did was take all of the research that she collected and told, retold the experience um, in the voice of each of these people. And much like the poems in the first three women, <clears throat> what I appreciate about them is that they are really alive and vibrant relationally <clears throat> again highlighting the complicatedness of and nuances of being in relationship with other human beings and kind of not knowing what to do or say or how to take action and all of the ways that we do <clears throat> so let's see this is this is the buddha's mother maya This is right before she gave birth. The gardens are lush green, verdant, blooming with life. Deer and peacocks wander the park, the pathways, and the air is thick with birdsong from cranes and laughing thrushes. But the beauty of the garden is veiled behind a blur of tears and pain. My body seizes. I moan and cry out. Pajapati places my hands in hers and sings to me. 
placing cool cloths on my forehead, massaging my feet, chanting and making offerings to the gods. Hours pass, I squat, I stand, I wail, I grow weak with weariness until I am wilted. Pachapati supports me as I reach for the long limb of the ancient shallow tree above me. I stretch upward with my arms as I squeeze down with my legs. I call up every last bit of energy I can conjure and let out a final groan as my son slides into Pajapati's arms. I collapse onto the ground, exhausted. Pajapati cleans and swaddles the baby, laying him on my chest. I feel soft waves of breath pour through his tiny body, the quiet, steady beating of his heart. Together we fall into a weary, dreamless slumber. I am aware of the sounds of scurrying feet, of hushed whispers, of worried words, of the cries of my baby boy. But I am unable to open my eyes. My belly is bound. My heart races, pounding. A thick stream of blood pools between my legs. I feel myself slipping away. I fall into darkness. And so this, so beautiful, just, yeah, so real. This experience of a mother birthing a child. And this, the Buddha, you know, this is his story too. And I have to wonder, you know, as he went out, as he left home, how much of this early life experience, these early life experiences were with him. How much of this did he unearth in his journey to enlightenment? And so these are Pajapati's words. Japati uh, became a leader of the Bhikkhunis and, and was given the name Maha Bajapati. At common ground, we have a statue of her next to the Buddha on the altar in the Dharma Hall. I wake up. I hear the cries of my sister. She has fallen into a fever. I bind her belly to stop the river of blood rushing from between her thighs. She thrashes and cries out. We lay the length of her weary, bloody body on a bed of palm leaves and lift her legs so her feet rust above her head. I gently massage her belly with warm, melted ghee. We wipe sweat and tears from her face and squeeze drops of cool water from a cloth between her parched lips. But the life is flooding out of her. Her once radiant eyes are now hollow and sunken, her full red lips now tinged with blue. Her breath is labored and unsteady. I listen as she takes her last breath. A brief, sharp inhale, and then nothing. Now I am the one who is crying out, my grief rising into the night air as bitter howling. I beat my breast, rip my dress, smear my face with ashes. I weep and wail until there is nothing left inside me. Doesn't this sound like a, an ordinary experience of a person grieving, reckoning with the unresolvable? And again, this is a human who went on to be, to ordain and to be a fully awakened being. I believe there's a poem here. Maha Pajapati, protector of children. I know you all. I have been your mother, your son, your father, your daughter. You see me now in my final role kindly grandmother. It's a fine part to go out on. 
You might have heard how it all began when my sister died and I took her newborn son to raise as my own. People still ask, did you know then what he would become? What can I say? What mother doesn't see a Buddha in her child? He was such a quiet boy. The first time he reached for me, the first time I held him while he slept, how could I not know? To care for all children without exception, as though each will someday be the one to show us all the way home. This is the path. This power of these words and this expression, you know, that it includes, this path includes it all, the deepest grief, the wailing and the not knowing, and the responsibility of caring for a, a new child while grieving yeah, at the same time, the loss of a loved one, and being right there in the intimacy of those moments. So Maha Pajapati goes on to say she she also had a child of her own who was eight months old, and so she raised Nanda and Siddhartha together. And uh, she says, when they are ten, I bring Nanda and Siddhartha to the annual plowing festival. All day, men and oxen labor in the fields under the hot sun. Nanda, simple and carefree, joins in, playing at being a laborer tilling the ground with the tree branch and swatting at the animals. But Siddhartha stays back, taking a seat on a hillside ov overlooking the fields under the shade of a rose apple tree. And this is, you know, a, a part of the a story that's often told about the Buddha, that on the night of his awakening, he had this memory of a very pleasant, a very peaceful experience, samadhi, and as a child sitting under this rose apple tree. But feel into the richness of this as it's told by Pam Wise. When I come to gather him for the noon meal, I find him sitting upright and still, his face wet with tears. I call out, but he does not respond. As I approach, I see that he has fallen into a state of meditation, meditative absorption. I place a hand on his shoulder and shake him gently. He opens his eyes slowly and blinks in the sun, staring at me as if far from far away. He says, When the oxen till the earth with their plows, they slice and kill the earthworms. His eyes are soft, tender. Then songbirds come and pluck the worms from the soil. As they eat, hawks swoop down and clench the birds in their beaks as they fly away. His voice trails off. I reach for his hand, but he brushes me away. Everything is food for something else, he says. I nod. But what happens to the worms, the birds, the hawks after they are eaten? Where do they go after they die? I know his questions are his way of trying to make sense of the death of his mother. Her absence hangs about the palace like a shadowy secret. Her name and memory are spoken only in whispers. But perhaps he is old enough now to know the truth. I sit in front of him and recount the story of his birth and Maya's death, watching as the rhythm of his breath rises and crashes like waves breaking through him. He watches me closely as I speak. When I stop, he closes his eyes. It is as if I can see the doors and windows inside him slamming shut. You are the only mother I have known, he says. Please do not speak to me about this again. And once again, just to illustrate how, you know, all of this, our formative experiences, all of our experiences in life aren't somehow hindering our spiritual practice in any way, but they are you know, the experiences that we get to connect with and really feel deeply into the roots of their impact. Yeah. And so the Buddha and his enlightenment also carried with him these moments where he necessarily touched the death of his mother or he reckoned with the arising and passing away of all life. 
even if it didn't happen exactly the way Pam is telling it. And then this other sort of lovely part of the story, the Buddha goes off and Siddhartha goes off and trains, learns his mind so deeply. And then at some point after his awakening, his father um, asks him to return to the palace. And he goes, and this is directly from the one of the, I'm not sure where, the commentaries maybe. So the Buddha finally came um, back to the, to the palace and um, his father, the king, was not very impressed that he was doing alms rounds, begging for food. And he said, you know, the warrior caste never goes on alms rounds. And the Buddha replied, the lineage of the Buddhists have always received alms. You know, again, pointing to this, the depth of his integrity and his practice and not somehow relinquishing that at any point. And... Yasodhara is there with... His, the Buddha's son, Yasodhara, remember, is the Buddha's, was the Buddha's wife before he left, and sort of have to wonder how that leaving happened and how uh, difficult that was for everyone, right? The Buddha, his son, his wife, the family. And because there's so little written, we don't quite know. There's different stories. One is that the Buddha left in the night and avoided... Uh, to avoid a conversation, a difficult conversation with his wife. And another story is that he had a difficult conversation and then left. So we don't really know how things went, but he goes back and Yasodhara sends Rahula down to see his dad. And we can imagine that this was not an easy welcoming, right? That this was the Buddha, and it was also her husband who had left her to care for the son. So you can imagine all kinds of feelings that perhaps were there for her. And so she sends Rahula ahead of her, and she says this, do you know who this is? And Rahula answered, yeah, that's the Buddha. And Yasodhara replied, that's your father. Right, so pointing him in the you know this relational realm like that is a person you're related to, and with tears in her eyes as the story is told, Yasodhara directed Rahula to go and collect his inheritance. What belonged to the father must be passed on to the son, she told Rahula, and. The Buddha then decided to ordain Rahula and so went on caring for Rahula from seven years on until he was in like, you know, was a part of the his wandering Sangha and was fully awakened at in his twenties, I believe, as it's told. And uh yeah, just like really has me um, in a deep inquiry about what it means to take care of children and what is the depth of uh, the legacy that we live that we can pass on to our children. You know? And the Buddha's offering to his son and it said that he had, he gave three primary teachings. There are three places in the suttas in the Middle League discourses that it is discussed what the, the Buddha taught his son. And the first, um, the first teaching was about integrity. It was around uh, the Buddha caught Rahula in a lie. 
And so he was teaching him about the importance of integrity, right? The first teaching is about integrity. Then he went on to teach him about meditation. And then in his 20s, that was like when he was a teenager. And then in his 20s, he taught him about wisdom. But the first teaching was about how to, how to live, right? How to tell the truth, the importance of telling the truth. And we have to think that this is not only about telling the truth outwardly, externally, but also telling the truth to ourselves about how our experience, how we are really impacted by experience. And especially all those places that we've had some deep wounding that get unearthed, that call us to reckon with the impact, both internally and relationally, collective and the collective. And so in that first teaching on integrity, the Buddha talks to him about lying and then also talks to him about reflecting on his actions and behavior. This is using thought. I'll read you a little bit about what he tells his son, if I can find it. What do you think, Rahula? What is a mirror for? For reflection, Rahula replied. In the same way, Rahula, bodily actions, verbal actions, and mental actions are to be done with repeated reflection. If on reflection you know that your actions would not cause affliction, then it is fit for you to do. If on reflection you know that it is not causing suffering, you may continue with it. He said to his son, If on reflection you know that it led to self-affliction, to the affliction of others or to both, then you should confess it, reveal it, lay it open to be, lay it open to the teacher or to a knowledgeable companion, and then you should exercise restraint in the future. So using, using our activity of our minds to reflect on our behavior is a really important part of the path. Right? And the Eightfold Path is divided in three components, and one is this path of integrity, or this part of training ourselves to talk and walk and act with integrity to do, to align our hearts and our behavior with the spirit of non-harming. So, yeah, these may not be the the days that we were hoping for. These days may be more complicated than we dreamed of or were hoping for. Yet these are the days that we get. And as we consider our next move and how we walk the path, We mark this as, as an act of simplification and and of not adding to our life story in such a way that causes more pain, right? but to really reckon with the deep truths of our experience, both the psychological truths of our experience and the conditions that we're living in. I was, um, my father-in-law, we decided to, that we would, we were not gathering with, with family at this time, at least my family's not, but we decided that we would buy some flowers and we would deliver them to a bunch of people that we care about. And over three or four days, we picked a few of them and went masked and met him at the door and said a quick hello and dropped off the flowers. And it was such a pleasant, you know, my mind wasn't really looking for more. Wasn't feeling really sad. I was did this with my father-in-law today. I'm in Michigan right now with him and 
it was really quite pleasant to have this simple experience, this mind that didn't want more, that was just appreciating being in relationship with these people and having this these few hours to appreciate, you know, the relationships that we have and the way that we can show care in this moment. I mean, the whole thing was so simple, like a flower on the doorstep, just a few words. And it really reminded me of like the possibility of simplification, of renunciation, when the mind isn't generating more. It actually is just accepting the conditions as they are. Just accepting the complexity. Just accepting this is the way it is. And could feel some good there. And many of you know that, you know, I've shared this, that it was in May, my partner's mother passed away. And so we've spent quite a bit of time, she and I here with her father, with Tom, since then. And we were really lucky enough, fortunate to be here to accompany Dorothy in her transition and then be here after with Tom. And so being back in this house, and we went home to Minnesota and came back a couple of times. This is, And so really just sitting here and being here with family and feeling into the truth of, you know, all of our history together and how life is really not, you know, there's a lot of beauty and we could talk about that and it's good to talk about that and and there's a lot of mess. You know, relationships are not that easy. And so there are moments when there's stress and conflict and we're not getting along that well. And it was like this through my mother-in-law's passing too. And thankfully there's, you know, this willingness to continue to return to the present moment and realign with integrity and to trust this capacity of reflection that the Buddha was pointing to, to feel into the heart that doesn't feels yucky when there's not there's been some activity outside of the alignment of our own integrity, and to keep trying again, to go again, to show up again, to talk again, to listen again, to do that with a full and open heart, and so in now, you know, just sitting here earlier tonight and appreciating that complexity. And that also felt like a moment of letting go, like not trying to make the complexity be clean or tie it up in a story that feels just perfect. Like, you know, it was so beautiful. We got along perfectly. There was no conflict. We were really right there with my mother-in-law's passing in only the most beautiful and perfect ways. And then we continued on. Well, it's not like that at all. <laughs> There's a lot of beauty and there's a lot of everything else too. And that all becomes, you know, a part of what we say yes to. And you all have your own stories of complex, complex relational experiences that are a part of your now. And it's the way that we relate to those and the way that we say yes to those that allow us the possibility of relating to this moment with skill. And perhaps this is what the Buddha did, you know, from the time he was a young child. This is perhaps what Maha Pajapati did. And this is perhaps a part of what their path was paved with, their path of that had led them to full awakening. Perhaps it was paved with these moments of conflict and betrayal and mess and the attitude of heart that's like, no, I don't want this, or depression or despair. Perhaps it was all of that. And at some point, a reckoning with that as a truth like oh yeah this is a part of what this heart is unearthing and needs to work through and make sense of and understand deeply as nature and that is the road 
It's not some beautiful, easy place where we have these moments only of deep states of samadhi and perfect ethical behavior. <laughs> Perhaps it's a lot more uh, challenged than that. Thanks everyone for listening and receiving. We still have some time and I'd love to hear from you what's moving in your hearts, what you're working with, whatever you feel like it would be useful to say out loud that would help us appreciate and embrace our full humanness in the service of awakening because that's what we're doing. We're purifying this heart so that there is space for that clarity and compassion. So anyone that would like to speak, just feel welcome to unmute yourself. Don't use the word purification because it it rubs some people the wrong way and it feels a little I don't know evokes something that's maybe not that useful but if it works you know I do sometimes think about it like that like when the system gets really relaxed and can rest you know it's like really vulnerable it's really vulnerable and in that vulnerability it learns to trust Right? The system, the heart just trusts like the present moment. And so it's more than just noticing a thought that, you know, what might come unearthed, what might become unearthed might be a really deep wound that we weren't expecting. Something that we've thought we have worked through early in life or that we've somehow pushed aside because we thought we understood all that needed to be understood except that the system, the heart, the body didn't quite push it aside. I'm feeling that now that there's this kind of level of activation just from the last six months that it's a bit, I was talking to a Dharma friend, another teacher earlier this morning and we were both saying that it takes a bit longer to settle down and that activation arises a little more quickly after the sit. Yeah, that makes sense, doesn't it? So just keeping that in mind, like this is really normal territory. The system is trying to survive and it's on high alert a little more often. And what happens when, you know, the system gets better and better at resting in the present moment, these really kind of deeper woundedness comes forward and we get to work with it. So it's never a bad sign. It's really just a, a very good sign. It's a very, very good sign. Yeah. And if you were to read some of these poems, these women, fully awakened women, they're talking about real things like contemplating suicide and um, being hungry, not knowing how to, they're, yeah, losing children and grief and despair of all kinds. It's just like, this is the territory we're in, isn't it? Yeah. So the next time we have this thought like, oh, it's just, I'm just sad or I'm just anxious. And what we really mean is that, well, I shouldn't be feeling that way. It's just nothing. <laughs> and perhaps we can give it a little space to express itself and not be so afraid of that. I go, what is the depth of the sadness? I don't know about you, but I've been feeling grief. I've been just inviting that and um, recognizing how many places grief is expressing itself. I was feeling that with I, this group of Dharma friends, a cohort of teachers from in training that I've been in for four years through IMS, and I haven't seen them with the regular intervals. We've missed two in-person gatherings and 
I was sort of full of grief today. I was talking to a friend on Zoom, like, oh, yeah, I didn't know that was there. I thought it was fine. Just humming along, accepting the change and activity, but there's a lot more that's often there. Oof, we're over. Two minutes. I'll give them back to you on another week. <laughs>